Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to D News Plus today. I am Trace, and this is the episode to start our new series on plastic, episode one of three. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes in this series. You do not want to miss these. It's going to be super cool, and it impacts your day-to-day -day life. It's super neat. You can also check this out as a podcast over on SoundCloud or on iTunes, and let us know over on Twitter where you find the podcast. You can find the show at D News. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. So today we're going to talk about plastic. We're going to take Take this big topic and we're going to break it down into all these other smaller pieces, which is kind of how we recycle plastic, but we're going to get to that later. We're going to talk about what exactly it is, how we invented it, where did it come from, how do you get rid of it, and what would a world without plastic even look like? It's going to be super cool, so let's kick into it. When did plastic become a thing? I mean, today you probably cannot imagine a world without plastic. If you're as old as myself, you remember when people who were adults were talking about cheap plastic, you know, cheap plastic toys from Japan or whatever. But in reality, plastic is a pretty new invention and now it seems to be everywhere. I mean, there are things like equipment in space that use plastic. There are things in your phone that are made of plastic. There are things that keep you safe in your car that are made of plastic. But what is plastic exactly? Have you ever thought about it? Because it's not just one thing. Plastic is a pretty broad term. It can basically mean any material composed of several elements. Those elements being carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, and even sulfur. Most plastics are known as polymers. You've probably heard that word before. Uh, a polymer is a bunch of monomers. It's etymology time, baby. I love this point. Monomer comes from the Greek word mono meaning one and meros meaning part. So it's one part. Poly means many. In case you didn't get that one. So polymer is many parts. I love etymology, it's so cool. So when the chemical process of polymerization happens, it's many parts merging into one thing. Two molecules essentially bind together by sharing pairs of electrons. They form a covalent bond and you get a polymer. But polymers are also a super broad category. It's not just one thing. Most plastics that we know of and use are made from carbon atoms. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, you know, silicones and things, but we're not going to get pedantic here. You know, that's not our style. So carbon can link up to four different chemical bonds. Anybody in org chem? This is a trigger warning for you guys. When all four of those chemical bonds are attached to other carbon atoms, you get stuff like carbon or coal, but we're talking about polymers and plastics. Plastics have those carbon chains connected to hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and chlorine and sulfur. So all plastics are made essentially from a hydrocarbon molecule. You may have heard that word before. Yes, it does indeed, spoiler alert, involve fossil fuels. But we're gonna come back to that. We're gonna get to that. There are also natural polymers, but we're gonna come back to that too. Most plastic molecules are just carbon and hydrogen, but some of those other guys are often included. Plastics are usually long, flexible chains of molecules, and that is one of the characteristics that makes it so we can separate plastic into a couple of different categories. We've got thermoplastics and thermoset plastics. Thermoplastics are meltable. They can be melted down and reshaped into something else. Their properties don't change when that happens. Think styrofoam cups. Once the plastic exists, you can reshape it, but it's pretty much gonna be that plastic forever. Thermoset plastics are not meltable. Think epoxy or other adhesives. Once they're set, they're set for good. You can't melt those down. If you do, their properties are gonna change completely. We usually know of plastics because people abbreviate the molecule names, but sometimes a company will pick up that molecule name and trademark it. So abbreviations you might recognize are things like PVC plastic, which is polyvinyl chloride, or PET plastic, which is polyethylene terephthalate. But there are also the trademark names, things like styrofoam and plexiglass. Styrofoam is a trademark, but what it is is polystyrene. Plexiglass, also a trademark, and it is a trademark for the chemical formula of polymethyl methacrylate. So next time you get a polystyrene cup, you could be all bougie, be all like, oh, polystyrene, you mean? But where did plastic come from? Like, why did we invent it? Before plastics, we had trouble making lightweight, strong things. You had to use clay or glass to make a container 
say. And they're not the best. They break easily, they're hard to make, they're very heavy, so when you transport them, you know, it, it's a little difficult. But really, we've been using these natural polymers as well for a lot of human history, things like rubber and cellulose from wood. We discovered polymers in a chemical way almost by accident. In 1839, a guy named Charles Goodyear accidentally discovered a way to make rubber that retained its shape. It could also withstand a good amount of heat, which is pretty cool. In 1846, a Swiss chemist, uh, whose name I'm going to butcher, named Charles Schoenbein, discovered nitrocellulose. He did this after accidentally spilling a nitric acid, sulfuric acid mixture onto cotton. Sounds kind of clumsy, but it worked out in his advantage there. In 1870, an American chemist reacted that polymer with camphor and created celluloid which now we use to make film and ping pong balls and all sorts of other stuff. Then we continued to experiment and the first completely synthetic polymer came about in around the turn of the last century. In 1907, an American by the way of Belgium, Leo Bakeland, gave us Bakelite, the first synthetic plastic, Bakelite. Congratulations to that guy. It was made from fossil fuels though. Ouch. Not plants or animals or anything natural. Double ouch. He used phenol and formaldehyde to make this stuff. Bakelite can be molded when hot and then it solidifies when it's cooled. And he opened the door to a bunch of other plastics soon after that, polystyrene in 1929, remember, bougie cups. And then there's polyester in 1930, and a bunch of other stuff. But let's get back to kind of how these are made because we could run through all the different type of plastics forever. There are two ways to do the chemical process called polymerization. There's addition reactions and condensation reactions, also known as addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. Addition reactions occur when you get a catalyst, and that causes one monomer to hook on to another monomer. It's just one swain for me, you know, monomer to monomer. But the catalyst isn't what's causing the reaction, it's just speeding it up, just to clarify. We use addition polymerization to form polyethylene and PVC, and polyethylene, by the way, most common plastic that we use. Condensation reactions, or condensation polymerization, uses catalysts as well, so that all the monomers hook up with any adjacent monomer. Think of it like uh, free love versus the other guys who are monogamous. The condensation polymerization creates byproducts, though, and it's a little more difficult to do. It takes extra effort to get those byproducts out after the reactions have taken place, and some byproducts are things like water, but others are raw materials that they can reuse in the next polymerization process. Some common products that you might use that come from condensation polymerization are things like polyesters and nylons. You gotta think about that next time you put on nylons. It probably came out of a liquid. It's just a couple chemicals mixed together. I've actually done this in chem class, and then you get some tweezers and pull it out, and here comes nylon. So interesting. Manufacturers can customize their shiz to make it however they want, pretty much. We've gotten so good at making plastics that now we can make them with different properties and make them in different shapes and in different colors, and all of those things took time and experimentation to figure out. You can probably tell that a plastic water bottle is a little different than a laundry detergent bottle, is a little different than a milk jug. Those are all plastics or polymers, but they're all a little different. They do this with different combinations of monomers. When a polymer is made up of only one type of monomer, it's homogenous, so they call it a homopolymer. There are also ones that have more than one type of monomer. You might think that that was a polypolymer, but that's not, it's, that'd be confusing. So they call it a copolymer. And those serve different purposes. Homopolymers are usually made for something that isn't dangerous. It's cheaper to make this plastic and it doesn't have to hold anything toxic like bleach. So milk jugs is a good example of a homopolymer. Copolymers are set aside for things that are a little more toxic like laundry detergent. The reason these plastics are so vastly different is because of the structure of the molecules themselves, their backbone chain as it's called. Remember, these are chains of atoms, carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen and so on and so forth. The homopolymer's long chain of atoms or the backbone, it's homogenous which means it's a continuous chain of carbon to carbon atoms. The copolymer's long chain of atoms is not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous. It's a chain of atoms that sometimes has other things that aren't carbon. Instead of carbon, it might have oxygen or nitrogen thrown in there. Other heterogeneous chains like PVC or Teflon, they might have chlorine or fluorine atoms in their chain. 
That gives them different properties, which means they can do different things and be used in different ways in this industrial process. So we can customize plastic and polymers a lot, but we needed someone to step in and say, hey man, don't be using the super toxic polymer to make water bottles. Come on, bro. Thankfully in 1988, the Society of the Plastics Industry or SPI came up with a classification system to decide which plastics are which and tell everyone. You probably have seen this somewhere on any plastic bottle you've ever used if you are moderately observant and you probably don't know what it means, but we're gonna talk about that tomorrow on DNews Plus. Guys, before we go, I wanna thank The Great Courses for sponsoring this episode of DNews Plus. The Great Courses gives you on-demand access to a huge library of really great video courses from experts in their fields. For example, Inexplicable Universes is presented by my boy astrophysicist, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's super awesome. You can help out DNews Plus by going to thegreatcourses.com slash DNews Plus. There's a link in the description. And if you sign up using that code, you get a free month of unlimited access. So if you like learning, which I assume you do because you like DNews Plus, check it out and let us know what you think. So here's a little homework. Pick up the plastic nearest you and look at the bottom and put in the comments what number plastic it is. Should be numbered between one and eight. If it's not, you might be in an alternate universe, in which case, hey, what's up? Thanks for watching DNews Plus, everybody. You can come find us on Twitter, at DNews is the show. You can use the hashtag DNews Plus if you wanna be more specific. You can also find me, at Trace Dominguez. Thanks for tuning in.